Okay, we'll start at least with some of the public service announcements, as we call them. Um, first of all, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the third B2B Talks event. Uh, but I would like to start with saying thank you to the people that are helping us to get you all drunk. Uh, it's the first event that we have Octopost uh, as a beer sponsor of this event. Uh, the Octopost team, please raise your hand. Okay, they're over here. If you are interested in getting leads and tracking them in social media, especially on LinkedIn, these are the guys you need to buy the platform from. I will not say that these are the guys you need to talk with because we are here as well. Uh, Octopus is a company we're working with for a very long time, uh, for more than a year now, uh, and they power uh, almost all of our social media, social selling operation that we are, uh, and services we are offering to clients. Some of our clients also um, and also some of the people here in this panel uh, use this uh, tool also for their internal uh, marketing teams. So if you are serious about getting business out of social media, you should check out Octopost. We will send you, first of all, you got in the invitation emails a link to their website. We will also send you, uh, after this event, a link again uh, to a landing page uh, with all the information. My name is Kvil Pravda. Uh, I'm the CEO of Pravda Media Group. Uh, we are hosting this event uh, in, uh, with one simple goal. We want to get B2B marketers to uh, know each other, share knowledge, um, also learn from, uh, uh, from each other's experience. Uh, the goal of this, uh, of this series of events uh, is to basically create a community and, and to help you guys to reach out to your peers. Uh, we're soon going to uh, also launch a website that will uh, include all the content from these events. Uh, we are recording everything on video here. And the goal of these events is uh, also on top of you guys knowing each other, uh, is of course to provide uh, uh, valuable content. And what we are trying to do with each panel is to bring good and smart people that are in the trenches, uh, that are facing the challenges that you guys might, might uh, uh, face either today or tomorrow, and uh, get them to uh, share their, uh, their experience. Um, there is also another important goal for these events, uh, and is to drink beer. So uh, that's why we are happy that we have uh, Octopus on board, and that's why we are keeping them in this, uh, in this bar. Just a couple of words about Pravda Media Group. We are a B2B uh, digital marketing company. We are providing inbound, outbound services. Um, uh, nice is also uh, a disclaimer. Nice is also a client of ours, uh, and Yaniv is uh, the VP of marketing of Nice. And um, we are working with, as we said, with Octopost, with marketing automation. We have uh, content writers that work on creating content for our clients and also distributing this content over uh, different channels. Um, and at the end, of course, bringing either leads or awareness. But we are here not to talk about us. Uh, we are here to talk about you guys. And um, the title of this event is how to scale your marketing organization. And we try to bring uh, the right people to talk about it. So first of all, let me introduce uh, the people here on the panel. Um, to my right is uh, Udi Ledogo, head of marketing of, uh, how do you say it, the company name? Yatpo. I thought it was a curse in Russian, but it's not. Uh, and you will in a second tell us a bit more about, uh, about the company. Um, Daniela Alfa is the VP marketing of uh, Kula Data. And Yaniv Tsokuman, as we said, is the VP Global Marketing of Nice Systems. Um, there is one important difference between the three people here on stage. Uh, besides the amazingly beautiful t-shirt that Udi has, it's an um, um, a online discussion that we had on Facebook that I asked him to come with this, uh, this t-shirt. Um, and that's, of course, that each of the people here on the panel has a completely different type of company. Um, Yotpo is a, how many people do you have in your marketing team today? Two and a half. Two and a half. Uh, they are working to recruit the other half as well. Uh, Danielle Alfer has a, a, a one-man show kind of marketing organization. One woman show. One woman show. <laughs> one uh, show. Uh, and Yaniv, how many marketing people are in, uh, in iSystems today? A bit more, a bit more. All together, uh, <laughs> my friends will kill me here. Uh, around 80 altogether. 80? Globally, yes. Okay. So uh, we have 80, two and a half, and one as a different marketing organizations. Um, so I would like to start with, first of all, asking you guys, what is the biggest challenge each of you have when you need to scale your marketing organization? Ladies first. Thank you. I'm also the smallest company, right? Um, 
I have two challenges, mostly. Uh, the first one is resources. Uh, we're a small company. We've, we're past A round, and so we, we have two VCs that finance us. But the marketing budget is very limited, and the focus is on uh, product and on R&D. And so I have to do everything very, very lean. Um, the second challenge is that we're unknown. And so everywhere we go, we start from zero. Of course, it's a, an opportunity as well when it comes to perception. But um, people don't know who we are. They have a hard time pronouncing the name of the company. I always have to spell it Kula Data. Uh, Charlie, Oscar, Oscar, Lima, Alpha. <laughs> it, it's terrible over the phone. So um, to start um, a conversation from that point is, is a challenge as well. So those are my two challenges. So you probably are thinking, uh, I have no problems, right? 80 people, that's the good life. No problems, large budgets, many people just sailing into dawn. Uh, well, unfortunately, it's not uh, that simple. Uh, the bigger the, the company, the bigger the problems and the challenges. So first of all, a couple of words about NICE and uh, just to kind of uh, set the context the context on, on the nature of the challenge and then uh, how it uh, affects marketing. So NICE has grown uh, very, very rapidly uh, in the last, I would say, uh, 10 years. And I'm not only talking about numbers, about revenues and profits and everything. I'm talking about uh, the scope of the activity uh, through internal investments, through acquisitions. Uh, our portfolio uh, has increased in uh, the, the size uh, at least a couple of folds, uh, three, four folds uh, at least. And today, uh, as marketing, we need to support something like 40 different products. And I'm not even getting into the specifics of different modes and uh, capabilities. I'm talking about true products that could basically could provide the uh, enough of business for every uh, small or to medium-sized company. Uh, and most of those products, uh, many of them are, are relatively new to new types of buyers, new types of decision makers, and new markets and new verticals, which means that um, in many cases we are practically unknown in those uh, businesses as well. The buyers don't know NICE, or if they know NICE, they, they, they know us and recognize us in a completely different context. So we need to establish awareness. We need to establish awareness and uh, presence there. We need to, to get, to reach to those uh, decision makers and to, to drive the business. So that's a, that's a very significant uh, challenge. And when I'm thinking about my, my own challenge, uh, although, uh, again, of course, the, the budget and the number of people are much, much higher, uh, the complexity is, is very, very significant. Um, and when I'm thinking about the, the complexity, I'm thinking of four drivers, the four Vs. I'm calling them the four Vs of my complexity. So for those guys in the audience that uh, are dealing with big data, the four Vs uh, sounds kind of uh, something is similar, but uh, those are a little bit of four Vs, a little bit different. So first of all, the volume. I just mentioned the number of products, the number of, of countries that we serve. It's uh, like 50 actual countries. You know, by the books, it's 120, but uh, on an ongoing basis, it's uh, dozens of different countries, different languages, different buyers, as I mentioned. Um, different stages in the maturity. The second V is um, the variety of um, the challenges that we have. As I said, 40, mini 40 different uh, products, but different maturity phases, different types of buyers, uh, the needs to, to deal with new types of uh, technologies, new types of techniques, different languages. The variety is just, is just huge. Um, the, four, the, third, uh, the third V is the velocity, the, the pace of change that we face today in the rapidness of, of the technology, in the, the expectations, first of all, our own internal expectations and the market expectation to, to adapt very, very rapidly to new channels, to new techniques, inbound, outbound, content marketing, different types of technologies, and to respond very, very fast. We all think of social media, just think of the, 
the immediacy of we need to uh, of how mu how fast we need to 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 respond. Where in the past, when we kind of created content and PR activities, we could plan it for for months. Today, if you're not there within five minutes, sometimes it's not relevant anymore. And the last part is is uh, value, and this is the different uh, V. The value, because today it's not enough just to do marketing, just to kind of do the, the activity and pray that the results will come. Today we need to justify everything. We need to kind of uh, provide the value, we show the value, first of all internally and also externally, to measure everything, to show the result, and therefore to justify uh, our activities and the investment in all the marketing activities. So all of that comprises a very, very significant challenges for us, and therefore the ability to scale and to cope with this increasing complexity, well, budgets are not increasing, and ad count is not increasing, it's very, very difficult. I, I just have to say that volume, variety, and velocity are well-known characteristics of big data, and Kula Data is a big data analytics platform. So <laughs> whenever I, I hear those it, three, I, can solve I know. I, I, just say it. I, I found a way to plug. I, I started <laughs> my first evening plug, yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, w one thing I want to say before I, I dive into the question that Kfir asked is that um, while I'm here to talk about my significant experience at Yotpo, I've only been there for two weeks. Uh, so most of uh, the experience I'll be talking about today is from my five years at Panaya, where I uh, finished my tenure uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and there I managed a team of 15. That's one five uh, people, which is why I'm here to represent the mid-size companies or the mid-size marketing teams. So I'll be talking mostly about my experience at uh, Panaya, as significant as the last two weeks at Yotpo have been. Um, <clears throat> so to discuss the challenges of scaling uh, my marketing team, I think the two main challenges can be summed up into people and budget. Um, when talking about people, and um, I'm, I'm being very down to earth here, uh, hiring good marketing people who usually we require a native language for, who have significant marketing experience, and I want them to work in Israel, is a challenge. It's a big, big challenge, uh, probably even more of a challenge than hiring native-speaking salespeople or native-speaking support people. Um, some of those uh, professions uh, are either more popular amongst the new immigrants here, some of them uh, are easier to uh, uh, train for. Uh, marketing is, is quite a niche. Um, I remember when uh, I was looking for specifically a Russian-speaking marketing person to manage the Russian-speaking market to, to do their marketing programs. It took us months to find the first candidates, and, and I asked the HR people, I mean, with all the thousands and thousands of Russian immigrants, how could it be so difficult? And they, they told me, look, we, we've been talking to the uh, headhunters and to the placement firms, and if you wanted developers, if you wanted pianists, if you wanted doctors, they've got tons of them, but finding someone who speaks native Russian and has significant marketing experience, it's really, really difficult. And I'm sure anyone here who's tried doing that uh, f shares that challenge. Uh, I won't go into all the solutions because I think that's what the rest of the panel will be talking about. Uh, but the second uh, challenge is, of course, uh, getting budget. Uh, I think Yaniv touched on that. Uh, today we're being asked to prove the ROI on every marketing investment that we make. Uh, it's very difficult to get more money when most of the time we're asking for more money to do at best the same that we were doing last year, if not less, because it does get harder. It does get more difficult and we need more money to do the same things and bring the same results that we were making last year. Um, but but there are ways and, and uh, tricks around it, so I'm sure we'll get to that soon. Sure. Um, for us, I have to admit that we have um, a kind of a super set of the challenges that you guys have, though we don't have 80 people in the company, not yet at least. Um, as a marketing service provider, scalability for us is, it's all about scalability, right? Because we have to know how to scale. And uh, a lot of the points that you talked about, uh, put aside the name, for us it's very easy. P everybody remembers Pravda. Other things think bad things about the name because it's an it's a old communist newspaper, but it's still a very memorable one. It's the truth, exactly. It's uh, probably the truth in Russian. Um, but we do have the same, uh, uh, the same challenges, especially with, with finding good people. Um, all the people from Pravda Media Group, can you please raise your hand for, for a second? So the guys that are working for us. Anyone here not in Pravda? <laughs> <laughs> all the people from uh, Yotpo, how will you say it? Anyway, so um, <laughs> I, I have the first uh, assignment for you in your new position. Um, 
so basically one of the things we've done is we, we, are, we are actually, we are actively approaching uh, Olim Chadashim. We're actually approaching some of the people that are working for our company. We've interviewed over Skype and gave them a job so they knew that they have where, where, where to go. But which leads us to the second, second point. So we all have those huge challenges. How do you guys cope with, uh, with challenges that you, are, that you have today? Me first? Yes. Okay. Um, I like free stuff. I use a lot of free resources. Um, as a, on a strategy level uh, that starts with partnerships, uh, Kula Data is a Google Cloud Platform partner. And I leverage that on a daily basis because Google is a well-known name, of course. And even if Google Cloud Platform isn't always as well-known as we'd like it to be, it's extremely helpful in opening doors and giving me recognition and, um, and interest in an initial uh, conversation. So that's a, a classic example of a free marketing resource that, that we use. Social networking, of course, we use um, extensively. We are uh, an Octopus uh, client, and uh, we use them on LinkedIn, using um, them across many, many uh, groups that are relevant to e-commerce and gaming, which are the, the industries that we target. Um, and uh, we use Twitter, we use uh, Google+, and we're using um, Quora, Quora now. We're looking for more and more ways to use social networking because it's a good way to leverage an existing infrastructure. Um, I, I use a lot of internal um, knowledge in the company. So we're a company of 25 people. More, most of them are, are developers who have specialties. Um, if I need to do something about predictive analytics, I spend time with the guy who is um, leading the predictive analytics development. If I need to do something that has to do with storage, I talk to the guy who, is, who leads on that and I get a lot of their knowledge and information, which I imagine in bigger organizations is a lot more difficult to do. Um, we use meetups. That's a new resource that we're starting to use in Israel and also abroad. So we have certain uh, target, um, geographical targets, and we, we've started to network in the meetup groups there. So free is great, and there's a lot of free resources that are good for marketing. Um, I outsource a lot. It's cheaper for us um, at the level of um, sort of volume that we need from um, of specialties instead of hiring people we outsource and so we have uh, help that we get um, on social media we have help that we get on communities and we're able to do that on a, on a per hour or per day basis and uh, do that very well um, and then I use content and advertising in a very very focused way and so um, focused advertising means people think they need big budgets to advertise on Google or to advertise on Facebook. I, I do sometimes do that, but I, I also look for more specific opportunities. Last week we were in Amsterdam for um, an event that we uh, initiated there together with Google, and I was able to find um, newsletters and technology portals and an e-commerce blogger and sponsor very specific activities that they do effectively to to get the leads and the registrations that we needed for our events. And so those are small budgets that are very targeted and focused. So those are those sort of how I deal with it. Is there a question here? Yes. Do you use uh, growth hacking techniques or? Uh, Look, growth. Yeah, I, I, I just okay. about growth hacking. Can someone here in the room tell us what the hell is growth hacking and how it's different from marketing? I'm actually building a presentation about it, so maybe I can say something. Yeah, so can you just talk to, to the microphone? Sure. Growth hacking, if, you're, if you want to see the, the most used term in the uh, entrepreneurs community worldwide, growth hacking is one of them. Uh, yes. I, I, was, I was always under the impression just like a fancy name for marketing without a budget. Um, it's actually a combination of a few techniques that in the marketing, uh, I said that it's a combination of a few. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, my name is Lior, and I'm building a startup um, uh, online, and I'm struggling with uh, marketing, so I went into growth hacking to try to find a solution. So it's basically a combination of a uh, methodology of a lot of uh, subjects that related to, to marketing, like uh, 
SEO, uh, landing pages, email marketing, PR, UX, onboarding, a lot of techniques that are combined together. And what I've noticed from researching this subject for over a month now, that it's actually focused on the one area that startups usually don't pay attention to, it's activation. Like, they launch a product, they do a nice PR, they get a few thousands or tens of thousands of users, and then nobody comes back. So they try to think about raise more money or raise capital to do more acquisition and from there to convert, but they don't think that the activation point is completely broken. Okay, so if we, uh, if we want to focus on your question about growth hacking, yeah. first of all, from your perspective, is that relevant only for online products? I th no, I think it's relevant to any system now. I think it's relevant to any kind of, you know, it can be enterprise, it can be online, it can be any type of... When you're saying uh, growth hacking techniques, what do you mean? What, what does it mean? It means, uh, again, a combination of a few stages. It's a f full process okay. that its purpose, I think, from what I've learned uh, so far, it's mainly to do activation on existing users that are on the database okay. without trying to, uh, you know, spend a lot of money on acquisition. Yeah. I, I think I, I, I arranged enough time for you to think about a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and translation. And translation. Yes. Um, I think the way you define activation um, is more consumer definition from the way you defined it, and we're here for a B2B panel. So from that definition, no, I don't, because I'm targeting businesses. And I'm also... Okay. Some of my clients are businesses. Okay, so uh, the... The level that we are targeting businesses at right now has has marketing automation in it and has a lot of guerrilla marketing in it. I think there's a lot in common between guerrilla marketing and growth hacking. And so if from that perspective, yeah, it, it just means original approaches and sort of out of the box. How do we do this without paying a lot of money, right? Exactly. Of course I do that. And that's all the free stuff that I talked about. But I don't um, target mass users to activate them because that's not the product, product that we have. have. Right. Okay. The question was about managing time in the context of social media. Um, the way I, I manage it is my focus is the actual content itself, deciding what it's going to be and how it's, what it's going to look like. I often contribute to the writing and the videography to whatever needs to be done to make it happen. The actual distribution, we, I make the decisions of what's going to happen, but then I automate a lot of it and I use an outsource help to, to do some of it. And so, uh, you know, there's different um, channels, but uh, on LinkedIn, 90% of it I don't touch by myself. I, I automate. I control the page, the, the company page, which I encourage everybody to like and follow, of course. Um, but I don't, um, I don't control the, well, that's not true. Okay, so we, we use, um, we post on a lot of groups. I do make the, deci the final decision on which groups we're going to, bombard with our content, but I don't actually, I'm not the one who makes that happen. I use an outsourced help for that. Twitter right now, I'm, I'm tweeting by myself. I encourage everybody to follow us on Twitter and on Google Plus, just get that out of the way. Uh, sorry? Thank you. Um, fascinating tweets, great content, really good stuff, very interesting. Anyone who wants to know about analytics, big data, e-commerce, gaming, Anything you ever wanted to know is right there. Second plug. Third plug, she buys the drinks to all of us. We're not around. <laughs> Only whiskey, single mom. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> she said she likes free stuff. So right. There goes the marketing budget. <laughs> yeah, right. That, that's my monthly budget is right there. So th that's, the, you know, it, it's more about the decisions and less of the, the execution. I do execute, but only in specific places where I sort of try to mass, mass distribute. That's where I don't execute myself. Not, not answer, just uh, yeah, he's more relevant to you. True. Um, okay, I'll try and answer some of that as well. So, so maybe I'll start with that. Uh, Leo asked about uh, uh, growth hacking. I, I can uh, relate to the issue of getting uh, new signups to activate and, and the detrimental effect of not doing so. Um, I think one of the issues that we discovered uh, too late in the game at Panaya was that uh, we were signing up new customers very, very quickly. And many of them um, spend a lot of time between the actual sign-up and activating the product. And even those who activated the product, um, many of them um, dropped off using the product very early in the game. Uh, only a few years later, we realized that, uh, what, what sh should be obvious, of course, uh, from the get-go, that uh, it, especially if you're based on a subscription-based 
business model, which I think many of you are. Uh, I know we are. We are. Uh, I think you are as well. Um, Today, the capital investments are, are not uh, the big hype they used to be, and, and people are, are getting used to paying uh, per month or per year for a subscription-based uh, product. Uh, if you come to a customer after 12 months of the sign-up and said, oh, here's your invoice for year two, and he says, you're who exactly? Because they haven't been using your product for the last six months, you're going to find it near impossible to get them to renew. Um, and that's when um, at Panaya, we changed the whole onboarding process of how we do the hand-holding of new customers from the day the salesperson gets the signed PO, raises a glass of whiskey, and throws away the contact details of the customer. And we hand that off now to the customer success team, where they do the hand-holding all the way to the next renewal, and they they are actually managing and measured on upsells and cross-sells throughout the year. So it doesn't matter who you're going to put in charge of that. <coughs> as long as you do put someone in charge of that. And if you want, uh, we, we've made a lot of changes. I'm oversimplifying it here. But uh, you can leave your salespeople to be responsible for activation and renewal, but make sure that that's plugged into their incentives and their compensation. If your salespeople are only compensated for the first PO they bring, that is all they will bring. Okay, No offense to any salespeople in the audience. That's what they do best. And that's usually the only thing they do if they're not specifically asked and, and incentivized to do something else. So that's definitely a point that uh, I want to thank Leo for bringing up. Um, I, I heard a good uh, online uh, lecture. Uh, you can look it up if you want. That uh, I, I forget the guy's name, um, uh, probably. And uh, uh, he, he said that you should invest half your resources on the first user experience with your product. And th that's something that he makes a very convincing case for. And uh, even if you don't take it to that extreme, I think it's definitely worth considering. If, if your users aren't ecstatic about the first use of the product, if your sign-up process is a bitch, if getting it integrated into their systems is annoying, if they need to call you five times and the salesperson is just trying to get more money and not helping them actually use the product, they're not going to come back. Okay, You may be able to get that first PO, but you'll see a huge drop. Uh, you'll see a cliff after the first uh, year of usage, and, and you want to minimize churn. So invest in that first experience, not only in product, but also in customer support, in hand-holding, your success team, whatever you want to call it. Just make sure someone's there for the customer and make sure that they get, um, get, get on board with your product easily. Um, going back to Kfil's question on uh, dealing with some of the uh, scaling challenges. So I'll start with people. Uh, one of the rules of thumb that I use is I don't hire someone new or I don't ask for approval for a new hire until everyone on the team is really exhausted with what they're doing and I'm 100% confident that I can fill 100% of the time of a new person. Uh, I, I try to do this on every position that I want to hire. I make sure everyone's uh, stretched to their max. And if I'm outsourcing, say, graphic design, then I, I show the math. I say, look, I'm, I'm outsourcing graphic design for 15,000 shekels a month. I can bring someone full time for a little less than that, and I'll be able to do more than I'm doing now with outsourcing. And I try and do that on every position that, that I hire. It's not just nice to have. Don't forget that as a manager, every person you bring, you're going to uh, have downtime to uh, invest in training them, in onboarding them. After a few months, you'll know if you made a mistake or not in hiring them. Um, and if you can't fill their time, it's very time consuming to manage someone who you can't fill their time in. It's maybe counterintuitive, but it is. Okay, So you want to bring someone where you can immediately bombard with work and do a short training period and get them to work in, in a way that will decrease pressure from you and not add more pressure. So that's one uh, rule of thumb uh, that I use. The second thing, uh, you know, if you're a believer in the Jim Collins philosophy of get the right people on the bus and then decide where the bus is going, uh, the author of uh, From Good to Great and uh, Built to Last, um, that, that's what you want to do. You want to hire the right people. If I have to choose between potential and experience, okay, within reason, of course, okay, if I need someone to manage the Russian market, I'm not going to hire a French person. But within reason, I'd much rather go for potential than for a specific experience. I think a lot of us dwell way too much on specific experience and requirements for job descriptions. You know, I'm looking for someone with a minimum five years' experiences of managing Facebook. Well, Facebook hasn't been around for that long. Where are you going to find someone with five years' experience doing that? I, I want someone with seven years' experience doing social, B2B, inbound marketing. Okay, people, get real. Hire someone with a head on his shoulders or a head on her shoulders. Um, 
talk to her a couple of times. If she makes sense, hire her, and she'll, she'll learn how to do it, okay? When I joined Panaya, I had zero experience in email marketing, okay? Uh, now Kfir is, is inviting me to panels, and, and we're talking about email marketing because I learned how to do it at Panaya. Okay, I started there five years ago. The first year was a learning curve, and since then, we've been taking it to, to new heights and, and doing amazing stuff. So just hire for potential, not experience, again, uh, within reason. That's why I, I never uh, post in my wanted ads anything about um, academic uh, uh, achievements or, or even specific uh, titles, because I just think they're irrelevant. Marketing is not something you learn today. Uh, I never did a marketing degree. I, yes, I have an MBA. I think the part of that that dealt with marketing was absolutely negligible to what I'm doing in, in my job today. Many of the best people in marketing today stud studied philosophy or engineering or, or a law degree. So it really doesn't, doesn't matter, just hire for potential. Um, that's uh, more or less about dealing with uh, people. One last tip on, on uh, people is uh, if you don't already incentivize your employees to bring their friends to work for you, you should. Um, not only has experience shown that to me, but also research shows that employees that uh, came to the company with one of the uh, friend brings a friend scheme uh, are more loyal to the company and will stay longer and will be happier in the company. Uh, you can intuitively understand why in a nutshell if one of their friends brought them to the company they're laying their reputation um, on the line. They're bringing someone who really thinks would fit in the culture and have the required skill and experience to work at the company. If someone is coming to work because a friend of his works there he already knows that his friend wouldn't bring him there if he didn't think he fits the culture and uh, has the required skill and experience and the fact that he's working with one of his friends also makes it a, a better working experience for him so everybody wins and y y the, usually the the friend brings a friend schemes you, you, you the payout that the company pays is about one-third of what they would be paying a, a headhunter or a external placement agency so everyone wins so please do that and use your employees to get the best employees that you can hire uh, for your company uh, I, I talked a lot about people, so I'll just say a few sentences about uh, working uh, within budget and in increasing budget. Um, one thing I think uh, Yaniv mentioned is uh, today we're asked to show ROI on everything we do. So in that sense, um, I can tell you at Panaya we had a rule of thumb that about 80% of the marketing spent had to be on things that we can directly measure what we were doing. And not all of those things are intuitively measured by all of us, uh, for example, trade shows. Uh, I've, I've been working the last few months with uh, several companies doing some consulting work, and some of them uh, uh, looked up to me when I said, well, how do you measure the success of your trade shows? And say, well, the salespeople were happy, the, the, we gave away teddy bears, everyone was happy, it was a beautiful trade show. I say, okay, but w w what about the numbers? Six months later, can you attribute specific sales to that trade show? Do you know how many new leads you met versus old leads that were already in the system? Do you know of the 800 leads that you met, do they represent 400 or 600 accounts? Do, can you tell six months later how many opportunities are at which stage? And, and they're like scratching their heads. No, who, who does that? Well, you can do that. You can do all of that. I'm not going to go into all the messy and gory details today, but say you must. Have to, you have to do that. And if I want to uh, splurge $200,000 on a trade show, I better be able to prove that last year's show that I spent 150 on brought in $2 million of sales. And at Panaya, we can do that. And I, we can do that, and, and something I recommend that if you're not already doing and you want to get another $100,000 to do a trade show, you better be able to do that. So, so get your act together and put together the right measurement tools. You can measure literally almost everything you do today, um, not only online, but also offline. And trade shows is a great uh, uh, example of that. Okay, enough for now. Good stuff. I love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> That's a great voice. So, uh, as uh, the bigger company uh, in the block, I would uh, provide you with a more, uh, little bit of a structured uh, answer as well. So, how do you cope with it? It's very simple. Uh, we, are, we are doing what I call top marketing. And what is top marketing? Top marketing is comprised of technology, organization, people, planning, and as important, promotion, and I'm talking about internal promotion. Well, technology is very obvious, and I guess all of us are using technology today to automate and therefore to save, to save headcount, to save uh, mundane uh, chores that we have to do. Uh, we're talking about market, marketing automation platforms. We're talking about uh, technologies like, like Octopus, for example, provides us the ability to automate uh, campaigns, to uh, automate social media activity 
to automate the way we measure things. And today we know how, how difficult it is. It, it's crucial to measure, and I'll get back to that in a second. But it's not that simple. And sometimes uh, in order to, to measure a variety of activities and campaigns and, and uh, industry events and channels and everything, it's, it's almost impossible. So either we, we just put in place 10 people to, to collect the data, to structure it, and then to measure and to provide the dashboards and the ins insights and everything, or we also use uh, technology to do that. But in most cases, it's, it, it's, it's a combination. Um, organization. In our example, as I said, we have many people, but uh, probably you will not be surprised that uh, the larger the organization gets, the more dispersed it gets. And sometimes it's very, very difficult to coordinate this huge organization, to make sure we leverage our competencies, and uh, make sure that uh, we are not duplicating efforts time and again, time and again. I will give you just one example. Campaigns. We, have, we are uh, organized in three different regions, of course. Not a surprise. And until recently, the campaigns were driven by the regions not necessarily at the same time, not necessarily driving the same solution. So just figure out that uh, the poor solution marketing needs to support three different campaigns in different time frames, if at all. So they are duplicating the, their efforts at least three-folds. We have moved to a completely different set. Now we are moving, we are driving global campaigns, making sure that at least part of our Marketing activity is being di driven through global campaigns, so making sure that they are aligned across the three different regions at the same time, using the same efforts. So now, every piece of content that is being developed, every activity that is being done, is being done twice, utilized by the three regions at the same time. Sounds very reasonable. Yeah, lot, very lot. Not that simple to do, not, not that simple to get to that point, but once we are there, we are saving a lot of time, saving a lot of budget, and of course, getting, uh, getting to a much better uh, uh, results and uh, impact of our activities. Uh, in order to do that, we need to, to drive the activities from the center. Again, easily said, not very easily done. Uh, to align the processes, different processes in different regions, in different LOBs, so from a center point of view, if you need to, to, to manage those processes and to provide services to those processes, just think of uh, lead to sell so, uh, processes that are running in a different way in the three different regions, and you need to support that. Even with your marketing automation uh, technologies, it's a nightmare. It's days and nights of, of, of just endless, endless work. These are things that we're, we are uh, changing. People. You've mentioned people. I totally agree with every word. I, I would, would like to add to that, that from my point of view, uh, I, I'm putting a lot of uh, focus on new skills. And today, when, when I'm looking uh, for new people to recruit new, uh, new people, I'm looking uh, into new sets of skills than in the past. And that's basically due to a very significant change that marketing is going through uh, from what I call moving from uh, uh, marketing uh, of uh, kind of an artsy uh, trade into a science trade, which is a completely different uh, requirement from us. But this is a completely big discussion that we can do in the next, uh, in the next uh, meeting. But in any case, for to, today I'm, not, uh, I'm looking for people that have very strong uh, qualitative, uh, sorry, quantitative capabilities. Uh, very uh, much uh, uh, interdisciplinary skills, uh, the ability to do many things, different things, and not being very much focused on the ability to just create messages or create content or measure things or... Uh, Would you say that it became more analytical, more mathematical uh, type of professional marketing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, the question was wh whether marketing today is much more of a mathematical uh, uh, profession or uh, much more measurable, much the, the need to have uh, the ability to, uh, to measure things, to understand numbers, to understand the, uh, to set KPIs, to, uh, th this is absolutely the situation. And today, every new guy that I will, or girl that I will recruit, 
if they will, will not have strong analytical skills, they will not, uh, they will not find a place with our, with our company. And of course, on top of any, uh, many other things that they, they need to, to know and, uh, and, uh, and do. Um, the fourth element is planning. Okay, again, this is not a surprise. The better we plan, the better we can uh, utilize our resources to, to understand where to utilize them, to, to be able to set priorities. It's very, very difficult, but without priorities, we, cannot, we, we just cannot manage the, the scale of the activities that we need to, to, to do and the services that we need to provide uh, and to differentiate different modes of activities. Because when we define different modes of activities, we can align our resources and uh, optimize them. Different types of campaigns. I, I mentioned global campaigns, for example. This is a completely different set than a local campaign or a thought leadership campaign. I need different resources, need their skills, different types of people. That's the ability to, uh, to uh, maximize, maximize the resources that I have. And the last and not least is promotion internal promotion and it goes back to uh, the issue of the first of all, we need to justify ourselves today more, more than in the past and in order to do that everything that we're doing we need to promote internally promote internally to our own partners at marketing to our own customers at the company and of course to our management and everything needs we, we need to to make sure that we have visibility that the company has visibility to our plans to our activities to the objectives that we have. We need to set clear objectives at the beginning of every activity that we're doing, set KPIs, and everything could be measured. Everything could be measured, should be measured, must be measured, and will be measured. And uh, of course, to secure the endorsement of the management to our activities, that's the only way, not even to increase the budget eventually, at least to maintain the budget, to maintain, maintain the marketing budgets that we have, and there is, a, there is a huge competition on, on every dollar in the marketing budget and, and the overall budget of the company. I'm sure you, you know that it doesn't matter if it's a big company, a medium-sized or a small-sized company. Um, I, just give the, I would like just to give the, the angle of, uh, of our company and the way that we do it. Uh, first of all, as everybody said here, it's all about, it starts with measurement because Without measuring the specific business processes that you do, you don't know where do you need to invest your next dollar. You don't know what is the weakest link. You don't know what is the place that you really need to improve in order to get better results. In our cases, get better results to our clients. And not necessarily putting the next dollar, but also putting the next hour of employee because our, our challenge is, is resources. It's less the budget part. It's more of the resources part. How do we allocate resources in the best way internally? Um, the second thing is, um, it was also touched by, uh, by other panelists, is being very, very religious about processes. If you are able to identify the key processes of your company and, um, and define them, measure them, and on an ongoing basis constantly go back and see, okay, so here are a couple of things that we saw with uh, this marketing program, uh, and it was a new, a new situation for us, and then we responded in that way but then feed it back and make sure that the next program or the next client in our case, in some cases, um, benefits from what we've learned from a different client or from a different marketing program, that's huge. That's, that's amazing because it brings us to the, it provides us the ability to actually constantly improve our, um, our performance without necessarily investing more time. We just know what is the right, we know better and better what is the right next step. Okay, what is the right thing to do now in a specific situation in the, the data providers? Okay, and that's why measurement is so important because if you don't have data, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot put uh, processes in place. The last thing is, um, is automation, but more than just the technology of marketing automation that we are working both internally and supporting our clients with it and so on, is trying to automate as much as possible, but with one goal in mind. We want to reduce the fluff Anything, every activity that, that we are doing internally, if it's not providing value to a client or providing hardcore value to the company, it means that it's less important. So we need to find a way to reduce this kind of activity. 
For example, we're using internally a project management tool that enables us to reduce the amount of emails we're sending internally. Some of our clients, some of the people we work with from our clients, receive hundreds of emails per day. It's unmanageable, it wastes tons of time, and some of our clients, I have to admit the smaller ones, are playing ball with us, are working with us in the same project management system. So we don't have to send them emails, they don't have to send us emails, they don't have to ask us what is the status of X, and also internally, when I have to talk with the read seats over there, and instead of having this long discussion of what happened this week with this client, and what did we provide them, and what did they provide to us, and what was uh, take us too much time, and so on, and so on, and so on, we just, with a click of a button, we have everything out there. It's ready. I can check it on my own in the middle of the night. And when we are talking at, uh, at 9 a.m., we already have the facts. Now we just need to talk about the things that need to be done. So it cuts the amount of noise in a major way. And the larger the company is, the noise is more challenging to, to, uh, to manage. For us, we're a small company still, so uh, it's still easier. But I can tell you that, for example, as soon as we started automating things religiously, both in the tools that we are using and both in the way that we are thinking about what we're doing, if it's not scalable, if it cannot be automated, it cannot be a service we are providing, for example, because we just can't cope with it. We've increased our effectiveness and efficiency in a huge way. For example, it takes us to onboard a client. Instead of a month, it takes us less than a day. Meaning for us, from our perspective, when we are onboarding client means the time from the time that we got the PO from the client till the time that we kick off the project itself. We already have a template of all the things the client needs to provide us. With a click of a button, the client gets an email, these are all the things you need to provide us. Now it sounds as if it's, um, you know, if it's minimal, if it's a minimal kind of effort, but it's not. Because especially when working with companies like, for example, Nice Systems, large companies that it takes time to get this whole machine working, to set up a campaign, to set up a project together. If we, from our side, can shorten the period of time from the minute we get the email from uh, Dolly, the purchasing from Nice, uh, the minute we get uh, an email from Dolly with a PO to the minute that Galit, Belkin, the, the, um, or, or Edith, the people that we're working with are getting all the things they need to provide us to two minutes instead of a week, it's a huge difference. Okay, so um, there is also a, a webinar we've done together with uh, Octopost about the same topic, and we've we've drilled down to that because we've shown all, not only method of works but also how we connect all the different tools, all the different systems, to automate as much as possible. For us, if a person needs to do the same thing twice, exactly the same thing twice, something is wrong. It means that we need to find a way to automate it. We don't necessarily succeed in it, especially when talking about, for example, using social channels, you cannot automate everything. You have to keep the human touch. But if we have to do the same thing twice and we didn't automate it yet, we didn't write a script, we have a team in, in India that we're working with for doing those small apps that connect the dots for us and so on. If we, di if we didn't do that, it means that something is wrong here. And to tell the truth, it's a matter of, um, of religion. If you believe in that and you are focused on that, you will get more out of your current resources because it doesn't require more budget in a significant way, and it doesn't require more manpower. Just use them and work with them in a different way. Okay? I just realized how much time I'm wasting having lunch every day. Exactly. So we have those I small. The we, we have the small capsules. We give all our employees. <laughs> yes. Uh, Thanks. Uh, you have discussed. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Tali Weiss. Uh, I'm an innovation research researcher and a partner of Coin Trappish uh, Marketing Communication. Uh, and you have discussed very intensely the the challenges, the operational ch challenges of marketing. Uh, but I'm interested to understand uh, how do you um, how do you come with uh, new ideas for innovating in your market and how marketing uh, is done, knowing that the globally the economy is not doing so well still, and the competition is getting stronger. Uh, how do you all all the panelists compete in this uh, struggle with this uh, idea? Just to keep us on, on, on the same topic of, uh, of the panel and connect it to your question, I think what it will be interesting to hear is, do you scale innovation? 
right? Because you have very smart people working for you. They are the most, uh, in some cases at least, the most precious resource. So do you have any ideas on how or any process internally on the way that you are scaling innovation, the way that you're looking at the market and reducing the effort required to do that? I think that's, that will be more connected to, to the specific topic that we are discussing. Well, I, I'll answer that uh, in regards to uh, marketing innovation, if you will. And not about uh, necessarily product innovation or solution innovation, which is a completely different uh, topic. Uh, uh, I think um, the basic answer is, uh, is uh, providing um, the, the right setting for the people. And um, to motivate people within the marketing organization uh, to be open and to constantly learn, to be in a learning mode. Because I think you, you, you innovate when, when you are exposed, when you are triggered, when you are angry, when you are looking for new things. And y y it's very difficult to, to say wh where innovation or new ideas are coming from. It could come from, from anything. All could come from an idea, it could come from a, an article that you have read, it could come from a discussion that you've done with a, a, with a peer within the company or, or in a forum like this. It could come from a, an event that you have attended. Uh, uh, from my point of view is to, to make sure that the conditions for my people are there to be constantly triggered and engaged and to welcome, of course, new ideas. So from, from my point of view, I, I set for my people uh, objectives to learn and to come with, that, with ideas. And uh, I reward more, I would say, the people that are, are more innovative, are, that are more challenging, that are coming with new ideas about technology or a different approach to do a campaign. Um, so setting, setting the stage setting this as an objective, rewarding people that are more innovative, that are provi promoting innovation. Do you measure Excuse me? Do you measure innovation? Um, I don't measure innovation. Uh, I don't have kind of a scale to measure innovation. But sometimes you, it's sense. You, you could sense from your people who is more innovative, who is driving uh, uh, new ideas about uh, changing processes, coming with new thoughts of about a campaign, the way, uh, different methods to, to, to drive your, your solutions, new technologies. You just see who is more, more innovative and who is less innovative. Not, not all ideas, of course, are valid or valuable, but I prefer to, to say uh, nine times no to 10 ideas than to say, than to just uh, have no discussion about innovation or new ideas with, uh, with other people. I don't really like the question, do you scale innovation? Because that's like saying, do you scale creativity? Do you measure creativity? Do you measure? It, it, I, don't, I don't see really how you can, and I wouldn't want to. I think if you want to, then you might actually get less innovation and creativity. We're talking a lot about KPIs. I know innovation is not creativity, but to me, asking do you measure innovation, do you measure creativity, that's a similar kind of question to me. And um, we're obviously all in technology, and we all f see ourselves as, as representing innovative companies and as being innovative and all about innovation, and it's part of our DNA. Um, and, and we're looking for ways all the time to do things differently and to come up with new products. And Israel, in general, is known for this. But to ask, do you scale innovation? Do you measure? That, that, that's a question. Yeah. yeah, I guess. But I like what you said about um, encouraging it, because it, for every good idea, there's 10 bad ideas. And if you're not open to the bad ideas and to, that, to the occasional mistake with it, to start something that is a flop and it's just terrible, nobody likes it, you kill it and you move on, then, then you're not going to get to the good stuff. And so you have to do that. The, the other thing is there's that Picasso quote about copying 
copying others. The be- greatest artist, you copy it or something. I don't, I'm misquoting him completely. But I <laughs> pay attention to our competitions. I, I pay very close attention to our competition. And I copy their ideas. And I start from there. And it ends up being very different in the end. But that's a good place to look for, for inspiration. And any place, I mean, a place like this is good to look for inspiration, right? But you, you, you need to be open to, to it all the time. That's, I guess, what I can add. Uh, so I, I'll try and add a few uh, new ideas to what my colleagues here have said, which I agree with most of uh, what we've heard. Um, and, and I'll treat your question a little more freely than uh, do we scale innovation, but uh, more how, how do we encourage innovation, how do we do more innovation? Um, one of the common definitions of insanity is repeating the same actions and expecting a different result every time. And I think that's, that's key uh, to what you're doing. If uh, your average blog post gets six likes on Facebook, five of them are from your employees and one from your mother-in-law, you're doing something wrong, okay? Your are a friend in Facebook of your mother-in-law. You're, you're a friend of your mother-in-law on Facebook. That's what you're doing wrong, exactly. <laughs> uh, first of all, unfriend her, and now you're stuck that's with five likes, and now what? <laughs> Um, but seriously, uh, I'll just give a few quick examples to, to open your minds. Guys, um, so there's one thing that we hated uh, at Panaya, and don't take this the wrong way, it's the, the term best practices. Because best practices just means that everyone is doing them, so they're not the best anymore, right? Everyone is doing them. So if you're looking for the document for best practices for email marketing, please do, first of all. It's a great start. But it's not enough to just follow those, okay? Uh, and when uh, my colleagues here talked about encouraging uh, creativity, I'll give you just a couple of ideas from some amazing stuff we did at uh, Panaya. We were wondering uh, how can we go to trade shows that uh, in the last year at Panaya we did 40. That's four zero trade shows. I know you're doing more, but you can only dream about doing 40 right now. But 40 is, is, a, is a good number of, of trade shows. And we were spending a few millions of dollars. About 50% of Panaya's marketing budget is directly attributed to events. That's 50%. That's a lot. It's a big part of the budget. And instead of going to a trade show, being there for three days, coming back with two or 300 business cards, we, we dared to dream and we said, what can we do to come back with 1,000 or 2,000 business cards or scans of leads from a trade show? And we put our minds to it. And I'll tell you in a minute, in, in a nutshell, what we did. But the next trade show, we came back with 3,000 leads from the same booth. It's a small booth. It was 10 by 20 feet or 3 by 6 meters for us Israelis. Uh, we came back with 3,000 leads. And one of the last trade shows we went to uh, last year, we came back with 4,500 leads. Um, in a not huge booth with uh, a single digit number of staff people at the booth. And th- the idea was there just to turn the booth into a lead generation machine. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details because uh, Batchen knows I've got a 90-minute workshop on that that she will gladly promote if you ask her when's the next one. I think it's in June. Um, but that's one idea. And then a couple of years later, um, I came to my Marcom team. Um, one of the key people in my Marcom team at Panaya was the marketing automation specialist. If you think that's a luxury, then you won't be able to survive for long. You need a marketing automation specialist on your marketing team. I came to him and I came to my Marcom manager and I said, look guys, We've been going to the same trade shows for four years now. We're scanning pretty much the same people. We're the best at scanning them. We come back with two, three thousand leads, but we're scanning the same people every year. Now, I have to be there because it raises awareness, and if I disappear, my competition will make a field day out of it. Uh, But I want to get more out of the trade show. I want to know amongst the 5,000 people walking around the trade show when the decision makers that I want to meet are walking through my booth. They'll usually hide their badges. They don't want to talk to us. They just want to see what's new, and they don't want a a salesperson to to sit on their shoulder and start selling them. But I want to identify as if I had a GPS on every decision maker walking the show floor. I want to know when they're in my booth. So a month later, they came back to me, and they said, look, we have an idea. And two months later, we developed uh, an iPad application that we called the DM Magnet, short for Decision Maker Magnet. Again, without going to all the details, but that has facilitated hundreds of meeting with decision makers, which we accurately identify as they walk into the booth. And we're able to identify those 100 decision makers from the 2,900 non-decision makers that walk into the booth. And so with those 100 people, we send them aside to talk to a salesperson and the other 
2900. We send them uh, uh, with a local host. They get a teddy bear. We send them on to have a nice day. So uh, I, I know I'm, I'm putting a lot of mystery into this, but this is real stuff, and, and I talk about this in a different workshop. Um, what I'm trying to say is, just like Yaniv said, um, I'm willing to hear nine bad ideas for that one brilliant idea. And you have to create a culture that encourages innovation. If you tell people off, if you, if you call their ideas stupid, which I don't think I've ever done, um, at least not to the face of anyone, if you <laughs> tell someone that he has a stupid idea, he will not come up with the next idea, okay? And the 10th idea could be a great one. You have to encourage trial and error. Uh, there are ways to estimate how a campaign is going to do, okay? Uh, we're all uh, in the business of writing content for content marketing. I've had ideas that I thought would do well, and they were a flop, okay? And I've had ideas that I originally didn't really believe in, but they brought in 4,000 leads in a single email blast. So you really have to leave a lot of room for trial and error with time, okay? And this is experience. You learn what gives you a better chance of succeeding in an email content piece or at a trade show scheme, what giveaway will work, uh, what kind of email people are going to respond to, what kind of webinar is going to draw the people and what not. But it's all about testing and encouraging that uh, innovation spirit and bringing the people that you think they have that flair in their eye. Okay, If you're going to bring someone that's been doing the same brochures for 10 years now, just like Yaniv said, it's not the right set of skills that we're looking for in today's marketing team. We have, I, I totally agree with what Yaniv said about bringing someone who's interdisciplinary. Well, that's a long word, isn't it? Who can um, really do a bunch of different things, who's done some messaging, some email marketing, maybe a bit of Twitter, um, done some trade shows. What he doesn't know, we'll, we'll teach him to, to know. But uh, it has to be someone willing to experiment, to not be afraid to innovate, and really encourage that within your team. I think that's the, the key point. Just to take off on this point, I, I think really the most important thing is, as you said, culture. Most organizations that uh, that I've met, also in my 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 professional life before part of the media, were not very tolerant to mistakes. They call it mistakes. Okay, it's not a mistake. It's not a mistake to invest X amount of money on something that didn't bring back the the ROI. It's something that you're doing in order to look at the long run and increase and improve your and optimize your resources okay and i know why you're smiling um no, i was just thinking mm. about a different term which is it's a missed opportunity missed opportunity <laughs> okay we are closing to uh, uh we're getting closer to the end of the panel and what i really would like us to cover now are your three top tips for people here in the audience people who will see the videos uh, we will hopefully generate something like 10,500 different blog posts about this event. Uh, so the three uh, specific tips that you can give from each from, from your own position uh, to companies that are struggling with the challenge of scaling their marketing organization. Would you like to Wow. Why don't I do one and then we'll do three rounds because I'm not going to come up with three now. Um, no, it's three all together. It's three all together. <laughs> um, but it, just to take off, to, to take off where I left off um, is <laughs> after reading everything your competition is doing, like Daniela said, and after reading all the best practices, which I joked about, but I do read all of them, of course, and I read every piece of literature out there on what we're doing. Think of something that hasn't been done yet. Think of something that hasn't been done yet. It goes back to the, my definition of insanity. It's not my definition, but if, if you want different results from what the be best practices are doing, you have to do something unusual, something remarkable. Think crazy, okay? When we go to an IT show, our booth isn't blue and gray that looks like a, a data sheet exploded on the back wall with 20 bullets that no one's going to breed because they're going to be obstructed by people standing there anyway. We do something like an orange robot standing on the, on the booth, okay? Do something different. Stand out. Don't be afraid to look Childish, don't be afraid to do something that no one's ever done before. Um, okay, I'll say my three. Well, yeah, I'll say, say my three. three. Uh, time. Yeah, you're right. Okay, I think the first thing is have a plan. Even if you change, and you will change the plan every other week, but have a plan, a long-term plan, a quarterly plan, a yearly plan, and you'll change it and you'll change it. But if you don't have a plan, then you're just sort of working in a vacuum without knowing where you're headed. And so um, that's very important, a plan and a, and a plan of how to execute it. Um, I guess I have examples for that you might call growth hacking. I didn't really think of them under that uh, umbrella. I love barter. I barter for email lists with other startups that have similar types of lists that I do. 
Cool it's great. It's, it's free, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a resource. It saves me money. It's, it's a win-win. So, of course, that's another think of the win-win. Um, always ask for a discount. There's a study <laughs> in the States. We're in Israel. It goes We're in Israel. Exactly. Yeah, but when you're talking... Well, whatever price you put there, right? you ask for a discount. Always, <laughs> always ask for a discount. There's a study in the States. Give me a discount. Right. It costs me money. Right. <laughs> there's a study that shows uh, there's a, something called a good guy discount. Um, some economists started going into stores to buy stuff, and every time they, he made it to the checkout, and he would say, is there a good guy discount? I'm a good guy. And uh, one out of five times, you got a discount. So um, I, I have to say my ratio is better than one out of five. It's not, you know, it's probably two out of five. But it's always important. <laughs> <good. laughs> so that's, uh, that's important. And of course, automate and measure as much as you can, but not at the expense of creativity. And so I think to be a, a good marketer, you have to have um, a combination of creativity, qualitative and quantitative together. And sometimes some people forget that. And all, all they want to think about is measuring. But what are you measuring? It has to be compelling. It has to be interesting. It has to be um, attractive to your target audience. And so that's, I don't know if that was three, but give or take. I have a note. Another tip. Okay. Okay. Outside the planet. If you want a good plan, you need, you need a good strategy. True. Sure. Yeah. Of course. I wonder how many companies here and in Israel got the real strategy. That's true. I think 20%. What do you mean by real? Real marketing strategy. No, real company strategy. No, real marketing strategy. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking to you. We're talking here about marketing, not about business. Okay? Yeah, but that's you, that's you, one, you, of just, just one of the saddest. Just I just want to say that that's one of the. In Israel, we got marketing strategy and then the plan, and the plan is going to be changed in much, much more times, many more times than it would if you wouldn't have a strategy. I agree. A, a plan. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. no one is going for strategy because it costs money. Because it costs it costs it's the it's the more difficult uh, it's the more d the strategy so you're saying that a strategy is critical and of course that's true at, at Kula Data the plan is an execution of a strategy um, and and you're right the strategy is critical the strategy might also change I can say that my plan changes but the strategy so far has not in the last six months or so but I'm I don't you know I don't know that the the strategy is the tougher one of the two the plan, and that's why. Well, and that's why you're saying people might not have it because they they don't know how to get it, or they they don't have the the right thinking for it, and they can't afford to pay someone to help them with it. I don't necessarily think a strategy is expensive because I think the best strategy is one that comes from within the company, and not as one not from an, an you know a consultant. Of course, you could get a strategy from a consultant. Many people do strat. That's what strategy consulting is all about. But that's sort of. But that's a whole other discussion. But anyway, the comment was about strategy. I want to change because the plan is much focused, much more focused, yeah. much, and is much better if you have a strategy, etc., yeah, right, etc. Et it's very cost effective in the end of the way. Yeah. So Thank you for buying me more time to come up with my two other tips. Uh, so here they are. One of them is start small before you scale, uh, and that goes directly to what we're talking about scaling. I'll just give example to make it concrete, so it doesn't sound like a cliche. Um, the best content that worked for us at Panaya was created either for free or next to free. Start with something small with a great idea. And if that works, then scale it and try to do similar things and try and understand why it worked and do more of those and translate into a gazillion languages like Yaniv needs to and, and uh, make it a good cultural fit for everything. So start small. If it works, it'll be very easy for you to justify the budget, OK? If you, if you write a content piece for 500 bucks and it works extremely well, you'll be able to get another 5,000 and after that, another 25,000 bucks to do more content. That's one thing. And the, the last tip I have for you is hire the best people money can buy you will not regret it, okay? If you have to cut down on your program's budget to hire a more expensive, more experienced, more senior person that you think could do a better job, it's well worth the money, okay? Uh, 
you should be paying whatever <laughs> a senior marketing person that you think is a good fit for your organization wants and they will be able to multiply that investment by 10 or 100 fold and do amazing things. If you bring five mediocre people just because that's the budget you have, you're not going to get what you want to get out of them. That's my last tip. Actually, I have one tip, but uh, I'm forced to, to add two others. So, uh, so first of all, of course, I, I will start with a cliche. Of course, uh, have, uh, uh, the must is have a winning team. And I think we, we've covered what needs to be done in order to have a, a winning team. Uh, and I, I totally agree uh, with all the comments uh, in regards to that. And it's a lot of the focus. And I've said about uh, the, the, the new sk skill set, interdisciplinary. And uh, I, I've read something that I, I found very, very interesting. If you have like $100 uh, to invest in a new technology, so put $1 in the technology or $10 in the technology and $90 in the right person to do something with this smart technology. Um, um, I will skip the second one, and I'll go <laughs> straight to the third one, <laughs> because uh, it's already been mentioned. Um, again, it's, it's coming from a, a, a context of, of a large company. And uh, in a large company, you have uh, sometimes a lot of overhead and bureaucracy. And you need to all, all the time to present what you're doing and to monitor and to justify. And it, it, it took me a while to understand that uh, not only this is a necessity, uh, uh, eventually that, that's, the, that, that's the right way in a large company to justify and to get the budget. You cannot avoid that. And, and for me, the, 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 the tip is, uh, Again, you need to show the value, and this is the way to show the value in a large company. Uh, you need to really earn your budget. You need to earn the budget. You need to justify your existence. You need to justify whatever you do. And it's a more of a, a soft tip. Don't fight it. Embrace it. <laughs> Just embrace it. First of all, it will, it will make your life easier. You will sleep better at nights. <laughs> you will have less conflicts with your management, and <laughs> maybe, maybe you'll be able to maintain your budget. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe. Uh, would you like to give your uh, your input? Would you like to give your input? Um, I wanted to add that um, uh, measurements are extremely um, difficult to measure, and um, you have to start small. Then uh, some rule can be. Just, to, just for, uh, for the video's sake, I just want to repeat that's an amazing point, Batran, because one of the biggest challenges is you can measure so many things today that you can measure things that are not necessarily relevant. And the point is if you can't, uh, if you need to start from, from, from day zero, measure things you can actually change tomorrow and don't spend time on trying to build this amazing measurement framework uh, that in the end of the day you don't have, to, you, you will not be able to act upon it. Uh, through the process. We've also wrote about it, some content in our website regarding, in our blog, regarding revenue attribution that says exactly the same thing. Find, attribute revenues to things that you can actually impact because if you cannot impact something, who cares that you attribute the revenue to it? Um, so just to, uh, to summarize the points, point number one was hack the process, right? Read what, what everybody else are doing, learn it by heart, and then find a way to do something different, right? Uh, Point number two, ask for discounts. Okay, very important. Point number three, start small before scaling. Very important point as well. Uh, point number four, hire the best people money can buy. Uh, does uh, Yotpo hiring now? We are, actually. We're hiring uh, for marketing, sales, and developers. Which means that whatever you thought you should ask for, add 15% to it. 
Um, and then get real. <laughs> 50, yeah. <laughs> and that's and, for a discount. And that's, uh, then, <laughs> then they will ask for a discount. <laughs> I'm going to follow her advice. Um, and two most important points, earn your budget and embrace reality. Um, I would like to thank you guys. It was an amazing panel. Can yes? Yes, of course. I was thinking about the, uh, the que your question about innovation. I really don't mean this as a plug. We have a webinar next week. <laughs> With a guy called Jonathan w McDonald. W no, no, <laughs> you'll, you'll find it. It's on the homepage. But there's a guy called Jonathan McDonald who has something called the Thought Expansion Network. He's British. And he's all about the kinds of things you were asking about. It's next uh, Wednesday, I think, in the evening. If anyone's interested in innovation, and you specifically, I think you'd enjoy it. But yeah. OK, so I think what we will do, first of all, we are posing for us as if it's a selfie. Oh okay. Yeah, well, I, mean, well, I can think about a couple of other people that are missing as well. <laughs> and that's true. Um, all the, the the points that were discussed will appear on our blog. But also, if any of the panelists, and by the way, any of the members, any of the people here, would like us to add links to the th email that we're going to send after the event for things that you guys are doing um, and so on, send us the information we're going to send by the end of the week. And also, of course, panelists, if you have anything specific you'd like us to, uh, to put in the email as well. I'd like to thank you all for being here. And uh, the bar is still open. We still have drinks. Uh, so enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>